Welcome back to Why Are We Like This, the podcast that treats Florida like the active crime scene it is. I'm your host, David Quinones, and I am joined by my co-host, Tomas Kennedy. Hello, Tomas. Hey, you know, I'm still in New York, and not only was there chronic flooding, flooding due to the outer bands of a hurricane last week, but now there's a fucking heat wave, and it's scorching hot and humid. I mean, why? why? Like, I, I can't escape. Dude, what the fuck? It is beautiful right now in da- in 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 uh my in unincorporated Miami Dade County where I am I, right now. It's I gorgeous. I can't escape the karmic punishment of a post, of a past <laughs> life that I've led. Jesus, <laughs> it's early October and you could probably throw on a light jacket outside here in Miami. Well, it, right it, now. That, that's the weather beautiful. here, but like, come on, it's it's hot. <laughs> 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 Joining us as always uh, is our other co-host. Forget the heat, forget the bucks. He's wondering where the Knicks were in the Damian Lillard sweepstakes. It's Cheryl Doherty. Hello, Cheryl. I, I, I'm sorry. No, the Knicks are a Villanova uh, outfit. We're not. We're not hungry for any Weber State uh, trash. Let him. <laughs> let him go to Milwaukee. This is a Villanova, a Villanova <laughs> boys only team now. This is. A, this is a. Fr- yeah, this is a frat true. for the Novas. That's right. Between Josh Hart, can I name them all? Josh Hart, Brunson, and um, uh, DiVincenzo. Dante DiVincenzo. Dante and then DiVincenzo. there's some guy whose name begins with an A who doesn't matter and seems Italian to me. I don't know. But he's not important. But he's there. So you hear that informal tone in our voice. That means yeah. that it's just just a boys episode today. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's going to be a bit meandering. We're going to try to touch on a number of headlines and news and notes and items that we um, we might have missed before we get to our, our sort of our main topic um, and the first one, I think, is the one that everybody's talking about. The most famous Florida man out there mm-hmm. right now on the on the on, on, on the market is um, District One's Matt Gates, the original Florida man. He's hit the congressional perfecta, done what so many before him have <laughs> tried to do, but never could. Uh, done what the the left flank of like the progressive movement that was telling us that we should have done, like what four years ago, three years ago. Um, I don't really know what to take from any of this, but uh, from the AP, Speaker Kevin McCarthy was voted out of the job Tuesday in an extraordinary showdown, a first in U.S. history, forced by a contingent of hard right conservatives and throwing the House and its Republican leadership into chaos. Um, Yeah, so it's of course, it would have to have a Florida connection because like, why fucking wouldn't it? Why wouldn't it be Matt Gates? But uh, I don't know. What what, what do you guys think? Well. Speaking of Florida con- connections, the uh, the president of the Florida Republican Party, when they asked him about this, his idiotic response was, "Well, once again, Florida is the center of the political universe." Like, wow, yeah. <laughs> great political yeah, analysis. Be proud. <laughs> Literally, just saying it do be that way. Yeah. It do be that <laughs> way. It do be like that sometimes. Uh, I mean, another thing that must be said, you know, with news that. The Florida uh, Republican voter registration lead has grown by uh, to almost six hundred thousand. Um, yeah. yeah, like we are probably going to get uh, if we don't course correct uh, rapidly and drastically. Uh, Florida Governor Matt Gates in twenty twenty six. So get ready for yeah. that, Floridians. Mm. Yeah, and, you, you, the, and and it also bears mentioning that like independents here break, break about what like seventy thirty towards Republican usually. I mean, especially in recent cycles. I was talking to a relative uh, who will remain remain nameless out of love in my heart, um, but who was asking <laughs> for an explanation on this. The assumption when they saw the totals um, that it was two hundred eight Democrats and uh, what was it eight, eight Republicans. Uh, Republicans assumed that the leadership of the Dems must have masterminded a way to overthrow the leader of the um, the Republican conference and found just enough Republican votes. And if I was a fifth grader reading about this and so I just saw the numbers, I would think, well, that yeah. must be what happened. You have 208 and then you have eight. Must be Man. that the 208 were in the driver's seat. Well, well, Those no, Democrats are they, bad friends. Why would the Democrats yeah. want to do that? They have 42 Correct. days until the government shuts down again. All they give a shit about is this Ukraine funding. You know, yeah. McCarthy, yeah. as bad as he was, and I'm glad he's out. I'm, I'm glad yeah. they fucking took him out. I don't give a shit. But, you know, he's going to get replaced with someone worse. I mean, it's embarrassing for the Republicans, but, like, right. it, this is, like, just chaos. And, and it's not good for anyone, really. No, uh, for all that, for all the noise, I'd say there's going to be very, for all the sizzle, there's going to be very little stake. Like they're going to have Jim Jordan or Steve Scalise be the next guy. They'll probably make the same. We want you to shove our agenda through or go through with a shutdown that would blow up in our face because that's what happens every time we try this. Stunt. Yeah. Um, 
And then once they re- either refuse to go along or they go along, um, they're going to suffer massive casualties of yeah. political and again, capital. I want to reiterate. So no one misunderstands. I am glad that McCarthy was taken out. Like, I, I think yeah. it's both funny and yes. good. Uh, it's a just end yeah, for that. Exactly. It's a just end. Yeah. But at the, the, the light at the end of this tunnel or the further darkness at the end of this tunnel is another government shutdown. You know, millions of people that are relying on their paychecks, not getting their paychecks. The Democrats, I, I don't want to as- make assumptions or, or, you know, directly predict the future, but probably caving on further cuts to domestic programs, you know, because yeah. of unrelent- unrelentless obstruction and possibly like bad, you know, anti-immigrant policies like uh, HR2 being tacked onto whatever agreement comes. Because what is the lesson the Republican conference you know, internalizes out of this. It's like, I, I better not fucking, you know, piss off my conference because a handful of, yeah. of rebels can take me out. So, um, yeah, no, dark, dark times ahead, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they if, if they learned anything, I mean, like the lesson that you would have learned in 2013 was like, this works, right? Because in 2014, uh, Republicans gained seats after kind of engineering that yeah. shutdown. So, I, I, I mean and it was a similar thing it was a it was a you know um you know a much more popular democrat president was 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 in office and then and, not uh, so far-fetched but probably still far-fetched outcome all of this which will also be kind of funny would be a a, a trump house speakership probably not gonna happen I love but it. it's, oh my it, God. it's oh, being child ballooned y'all and, and a lot of ridiculous yeah. firsts are happening all the time in this country so this is this is not this is not necessarily an overtly political podcast but like we should mention the fact that like uh because i saw a lot of people exclaiming surprise at this that you don't have to be you can be literally anybody to be speaker like you don't have to be a member of the of of congress or even an elected official or even in public service you could just be anybody i think how does that square with like don't you have to be you have to be 35 to be president and speaker is the third in line of succession like what don't you, you would have to be 35 to be speaker, I would imagine, right? I guess I think Trump it's 25 for congressionals, if I'm not mistaken. 25 for Congress and 35 for the presidency. Yeah, but to be speaker specifically, right? Because you're in thir- you're 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 in the line of succession. I don't know. I don't know how any of that works. Either. We need so. to yeah. lawyer shows what the fuck I know. Do this. <laughs> Guys, can we head back down south a little closer to me? Can we talk about our our favorite mayor? Um, oh yes, <laughs> America's mayor, <laughs> Miami Mayor Francis Suarez. Oh, I, I listener, I know you're tired of hearing about this guy. I know that we talk about him every fucking week, but it's not our fault. He literally does something every yeah. fucking week. That I, we I have literally to talk told about. this to someone today. I was like, this is the worst day of Francis Suarez's life, immediately followed by every single other day for the rest of his life. (laughs) Yeah, we'll stop. We'll stop opening the gifts that he gives us when he stops being so generous with his cornucopia of embarrassment that he calls a mayorship. So the the latest gift from the Miami Herald and Sarah Blasky, uh, Mayor Suarez praised Ken Griffin, another subject of this podcast frequently. Um. Uh, Ken Griffin of uh, Citadel Capital. Ken Griffin's controversial plan. Richest man in Florida now, yeah. Uh, Billionaire's aide wrote the quote. So here's the story. When a reporter asked Miami Mayor Francis Suarez to comment on billionaire Ken Griffin's controversial plan to relocate a historic home from his $106 million Bayfront estate and turn it into a tourist attraction, the mayor gushed in full-throated support. Here's what he had to say. Quote, The idea that the public could visit this historic house for the first time and for generations to come is incredible, Suarez said through a spokesman. The citizens of Miami, South Florida, and visitors from all over the world would be able to appreciate firsthand its significance and beauty. So we hope this project moves forward. Tomas, what's wrong with that quote? What what did we find out today? What we found out is that the spokesperson for Ken, uh, Ken Griffin, CEO of Citadel, actually wrote the quote literally word for word send it sent it to the mayor's office and they used it and again ken griffin is the same guy that gifted the thirty thousand dollar formula one tickets that triggered the state ethics investigation following my complaint so it it just shows the the insane level of of influence and access that this billionaire who has projects before the city of Miami has at the mayor's office, literally writing his press releases. And not only that, uh, David, there's another part in the article where uh, they, they reference how the, the mayor's 
uh, former spokesperson, not Citadel's, but Francis's spokesperson, Soledad Cedro, who has now resigned after the weight of all these controversies, actually wrote um, articles because she was previously a quote unquote journalist. And I emphasize uh, the, the quote unquote there. Uh, she wrote articles for a, a Spanish language um, a, a journalistic outlet called Infobay praising Ken Griffel, Griffin and his business, the city of Miami, while being employed for Francis Suarez as the spokesperson herself, while Ken Griffin was lobbying the city of Miami, while he was giving these undisclosed, secret, unethical gifts, and she did not even disclose in the byline of these articles that she was employed right. by the city of Miami. It's, it's crazy. Like the, the, uh, this is a, a lot of these things, like they're, they kind of like are, we've talked about this way that like norms have just kind of gone out the window and like little ways of doing things, but like the, the disclosure of who's writing your check, who's writing the check of the person that is writing the fucking content. I feel like that is something that is completely bygone, and especially especially yeah. down here. I'm constantly seeing content that just like I have to know all the cheese man, all the fucking back channel people, and be like, "Oh, that's so and so's cousin. Oh, that guy's related to him." Yeah. And like, "Oh yeah, I see why he's writing. Why he's writing that." The Herald op-ed page has become one of the worst purveyors of this, where you have to dig like three or four re- like um, layers deep to find out like, "Oh, it actually turns out that this guy writing the uh, an, an op-ed about why we have to like you know." Uh, close the borders off as this financial, um, you know, connection to fucking George Mason University. Of course, and look, like that. anybody who listens to this podcast or knows any of us, uh, at least speaking for myself, we're not some purveyors or upholders of etiquette, norms, and decorum. But it's just, it's yeah. just, it's just honesty and integrity, right? And 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 responsibility to to the public, right? Like as a journalistic outlet. Like you have to disclose conflicts of interest for uh, of people that are writing your stories, particularly if they're in, in, in government and they're writing, you know, about a, a lobbying interest for that government. I mean, it's fucking insanity. Even on social media, you have to register if a post you made is sponsored or yeah. an ad. Like this guy is like at the Genesis. Like be- yeah, I was about to say below the Jenners, like below <laughs> the Kardashians. Like like this. <laughs> This is like so unscrupulous. And like, again, like we're not trying to do like pearl clutching, but it's like, yeah. to, to David's point, any, you want to make it so that anytime like the head of your municipality opens his mouth, you have to wonder how much the person paid him to say what he's saying. Like, I get it that we're all like aware of like how things function and not just like local, but yeah. state and federal office, but like at least own your shit, man. <laughs> like, at least- look, all, all, all jokes aside, you know, we're yeah. at, at the heart of it. We are, we are in an anti-corruption watchdog podcast, or at least we try to be, and we try to, yeah. you know, inject humor to, to make it entertaining. Or at least that's what we uh, try or uh, yeah. to do or aspire to do. But like, Jesus fucking Christ, like they are, they're lying to you, viewer. Like your, your, your government is hand in hand with private equity lying to you to rip you off and destroy your quality of life <laughs> like wakey wakey yeah. i just I, the other the other thing i wanted to bring up too was um that uh, uh again uh, somebody else that we talked about last week alex diaz de la portilla currently um uh, facing a lot of charges uh city of uh, city of miami commissioner removed from office he's not a city of removed miami from office yeah not anymore former yeah <laughs> freshly former is still running ads you said right like did you catch these ads like his he, with his mom like, well yeah crying i, I, I called into actualidad radio today to talk about another francis story the, the 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 lavish uh trips to to south korea and japan in which he took bodyguards paid by taxpayers you know, and that in February, that. In when that asked before. by the Herald, they said at the New Times, sorry, they said that, they, you know, no city funds were used on these bodyguards. Turns out through public records request that they had actually it had all been funded by the taxpayers. Um, anyways, the Alex Diaz de la Portilla, this disgraced arrested commissioner for money laundering, criminal conspiracy, bribery, uh, a ton of other uh, charges who was removed from office because of this, is running ads all over Spanish language radio in Miami, nonstop, every commercial break. We, I heard him every single block this morning when I was on and when I was listening. 
with his mom. Well, there's a, a woman saying that his mom is too grief stricken over what happened to his son to, to, to actually appear on the, on the commercial, but that she's crying because liberal prosecutors are, 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 are engaging in a witch hunt, just like Donald Trump, and that God will punish those who seek to do harm uh, against an innocent man. I mean, just imagine being a, a, an adult, a large it's deranged. adult, yeah, it's true. you're a public official and you get your mommy to go cry yeah. for you, you know, in front of the whole city, you know, on the radio. I mean, we, we, they, these people are embarrassing our city and community, not just at a local, at a statewide, it's, it's a national embarrassment. We are laughing stuff. Yeah, it's a joke. It's a laughing stock. It's ridiculous. And I, I mean, th his case, I, I really feel like based on all the like sort of uh, scuttlebutt that you hear about it, it seems like it's going to be a pretty fucking open and shut. Like it's it's a mountain of of allegations and evidence and I, uh, whatever. I mean, it has to be adjudicated. But like it, to, to just say like, oh, it's, you Dude, know, they, they, political. They, they got him dead to rights. He was he was basically selling his vote over a multimillion dollar developer pro developer project uh, involving a, a, a private charter school owned by these anti-vaxxer psychos over a couple yeah. of hundred thousand dollars of campaign donations, you know, and, and other things. I mean, this guy was engaging in clear pay to play practices, selling his vote. It, insanity. The sent the Sentners, Sentner Academy owned by the Sentners, who, by the way, share a uh, share a, uh, a, a an advisory firm with uh, aforementioned um, Ken Griffin. Hmm, interesting. Mm -hmm. I wonder, I wonder yeah, the, what the connection the, the there web, could be. The web. Know. It's like that meme of the that, 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 that guy, you know, with the fucking web behind him on the chalkboard. Oh, Glenn Beck? Uh, I think it's... Well, I was thinking Charlie yeah. Day. I was thinking Charlie from oh, Always Sunny. Okay. <laughs> the, yes, it's a, a whole lot yeah. of... Uh, yeah, but yeah, we're, whole, we're, the, we're of... the lib Glenn Beck, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Except all our lines are financial <laughs> <laughs> and like clearly documented. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it makes it, it, it makes you crazy. It makes you sound crazy trying to explain this shit. It really does. Like Billy touched on it last week about how we sound insane talking about this stuff, and it's but it's literally just r r stenography. We're just t saying what is happening. We're just saying the things that are going on. Um, now, now here is the part where I sound insane. My conspiracy corner, guys. Okay. Just a, a last little news and note that I want to that I want to bring up. Let's go. Um, so down here we have like really low air quality this week. And how do I how do I qualify this? All right, let me just say it. Fuck it. Um, we have really bad air quality this week. Every single meteorologist and member of the mainstream media it says that the it lamestream is, media, the lamestream media, more like it, um, is telling me. And all of us that it's from the Canadian wildfires. They've pulled a classic fucking crocodile Dundee boomerang where they went like a thousand miles into the. Were those months ago? Yes, from those. Hmm. That what? Oh. And now uh, let, me, let me let me let me pull this up. Do you guys have the have the notes in front of you? Can you guys look at the notes? Yeah, okay. I know the story. Yes. Okay, so chair, I'll I'll, I'll I'll explain it to you. Do you see the two okay. pictures that I'm showing you I here? Do. Okay, the I one do. the one on the the one on the on the left. Is a picture yes. of the um, of the Canadian wildfire, uh, you know, the 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 redder the worse, right? The, the the that's the effects of the particulate. That's the measured, you know, air pollution in those areas. Okay. And then the picture on the right is a picture of all of Florida's controlled burn sugar mill areas, like where we where uh. we normally do controlled burns now. If, if Ron DeSantis wasn't such a huge enemy of sugar, I would think that, like, maybe there was a, um, I don't know, like a state-level conspiracy going on. Because it really looks, if you look at these maps, like this is just more of these controlled burns that are incredibly toxic, probably carcinogenic, like that we talked about on our episode with Craig Pittman briefly. We, we spoke about this, um, that this is something that has been a generational problem with, for, for people who grow up in places like Pahokee and in, you know, around Lake Okeechobee, um, the mostly black, poor, very poor, like deeply impoverished communities that don't really have any recourse to deal, to deal with it. Um, we talked about that great reporting that the Sun Sentinel, I'm sorry, that the Palm Beach Post did with, um, with ProPublica a few years ago and how they really dug in, in into like how the state doesn't properly monitor and the, the one monitor 
uh, alert that they have for air quality has been busted for like five years and that they, they've never spent the $30,000 to fix it. So there's no telling really how bad the air quality is coming off of these sugar mills. I don't know. This is my little conspiracy corner. Uh, it, Florida sugar, Florida crystals are known for lying a lot. They are known for manipulating media, whatever. I just these 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 plants are burning things all the time, though, right? Yeah. So the so contention that, the, the contention yeah. would be if you're insane like me and you pulled up, um, mm-hmm. you know, some <laughs> what was it? Some some uh, crop valuation um, reports from the Department of uh, the Department of Health uh, over the course, David. <laughs> <laughs> and you notice that sh- that raw sugar has been going up since um, since DeSantis took office in 2019. Raw sugar in the state of Florida has gone up 25% year over year, continually. So like a compounded, mm-hmm. like effectively more than doubled since 2019, right? And since 2019, uh, some very key, I don't want to get into the minutiae of this, but like the, some very key leg- um, uh, reg- uh, regulations have been rolled back, I mean, along with countless other regulations under DeSantis, but he's rolled back a lot of regulations surrounding the, um, like when when these companies are permitted to do these burn-offs, right? So the burn-offs have gotten heavier and more intense and deeper because sugar production has effectively doubled because we've been sitting home for three years pouring sugar down our fat fucking faces. And like, that's just the nature. The demand is higher than it's ever been for sugar. Um, so I don't know. I would like, I would, I would like to see somebody smarter than me weigh in on this because so far all i've seen are just like tv meteor meteorologists saying the exact same like 10 words about how it's from how it's you know trade winds from canada which just which is usually just a good cue for what sinclair is pushing yeah it's like, one i of understand those. the suspicion <laughs> yeah i don't know um my contention with this is there would have to be new plants for it to lead to such a shift in air quality all at See, once See, but gerald these don't um, come from the plants these come from the fields the burn yeah, comes exactly. from the fields. Nope. Yeah. Okay. It's, if right. you've ever seen this done, it's like a very brutal process of just like, it's like clear and burn. Like the 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 same um, John Deere that's like running it over and clearing it has like mm-hmm. a spigot fire, like flamethrower out of, out of the back that burns. I see. And it creates this incredibly insane toxic plume. There's a documentary about the Muck Bowl, which is like a very famous football game high school football game that's held every year down here in, 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 in South Florida, uh, where, I mean, like you look at the amount of NFL players that these two high schools have produced and it's like, you know, what's in the water type of situation. And these kids become great by um, when the, when the, these kids become great at football by when the fire comes out of the back of these machines, it, 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 it uh, scares out rabbits. And these kids, when they're like five, six, seven years old, chase the rabbits in the muck. And then 10 years later, you fast forward and they're five star running backs. And so it's just it's, it's interesting, whatever. Go, go go watch it if you want. But um, I don't know. I feel like a little sensitivity to, to that issue because I've, I've been up there. I've done some reporting. I used to do some reporting up there. I mean, you know, it's, it's something that we should ask friend of the pod, Craig, Craig Pittman. Uh, I mean, look, good, good, David, good point. I'm not a meteorologist or an air quality expert, but I also find that very weird to attribute this to California wildfire. I mean, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. Canadian, Canadian wildfires. Yeah. Across that's still, half of the yeah. North American landmass. I mean, you know, we, we do get, you know, um, a, uh, what's a hair and dust, yeah. dust here. So it's possible, but we, it's, it, we can't discount, you know, the, the, the environmental and, and human damage that these, you know, "Quote unquote controlled sugarcane burns have have been doing to communities in in Florida for for decades now, and they're just getting worse, like you said. So I, I think there's 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 something there, man. Yeah, you know what? I'm gonna reach out to Greg. We're gonna see. We'll see about this. We'll fucking we'll yes. see about this. And you know what? Maybe I'm fucking just crazy. You guys, if like, thank God that I that our our group chats are not public because if people could see the kind of fucking <laughs> conspiracy shit that I engage in, like, um, likewise, probably David, would... as you know, likewise. <laughs> <laughs> So look, moving on to our main topic, and it's like, it's kind of hard to define, and maybe you guys can help me define it, because it was like this amalgamation of several news stories and topics that kind of speak more directly to the problems that we have here in Florida. And it's this idea that somehow voting for different 
parties is the way to fix Florida or like, and, and I just kind of wanted to throw out this, this collection, like a bundle of, of, of sticks and just kind of throw it like, like kindling and, 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 and kind of let you guys cook with it because I, 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 I just want to, I can't cook with gas here in New York, David. It took my stove away. Yeah. It's electric it's stoves. It's like, yeah. like, <laughs> out of your co as, as Tomas uh, ships his camera over to show us his, his, like, uh, his yeah. gas though. And that they, they, they're going to have to, that uh, Eric Adams is going to have to pry out of his yeah. cold dead hands. From my cold um, dead hands, David. So Joe Biden's administration has, this is, uh, you know, been news today. His administration has begun the process of delivering on uh, one of actually the biggest campaign promise, but not from his campaign, from the AP today. Uh, the byline is McAllen, Texas. The Biden administration announced it has waived 26 federal laws in South Texas to allow border wall construction on Wednesday, uh, marking the administration's first use of a sweeping executive power employed often during the Trump presidency. By the way, I was kind of surprised to learn that. I, I didn't know that he had like not used any executive. I thought that that was just like a thing everybody was doing now. Just like every president was just like going ham on the executive orders. But I guess he hasn't done that. Uh, shows what the fuck I know. The Department of Homeland Security posted the announcement on the U.S. Reg Florida, uh, Federal Registry with few details outlining the construction in Star County, Texas, which is part of a busy Border Patrol sector seeing high illegal entry, according to government data, blah, 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 whatever. So he's going to build the wall. Biden's going to build the wall where where Trump where Trump didn't. Or am I making, like, too much of that? Is, is there, Gerald, you and I were talking before we started recording about, like, these excuses that people make for their favorite politicians or their favorite people. Like, oh, no, actually, you know, it's not that he's going to build the wall. And I haven't really been paying close enough attention to the discourse, but am I fucking crazy? Is this guy going to literally build the wall like the deliver on the biggest campaign promise of his opponent like i mean he uh, is it, <laughs> yeah that's the thing it's it, it tells you that like voting for a guy who you think is your friend to oversee this like cruel and inhuman machine is not going to make the machine less cruel and less inhuman so i mean i yeah i'm only just getting flashbacks to it now but when they had the border patrol agents on horses whipping um what was it uh Asian, Asian, yeah. Yeah. Oh my God! Like, you, like you you wouldn't even know what that this was like from today's era if you were just watching like MSNBC or CNN. Like that 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 happened just two years ago. Um, no, it's it's you know like we like we're not trying to sound smarter or cleverer than now, but like if I was more naive, if I was if I was myself from ten years ago, this is the kind of thing that would break my heart. Yeah. Because what am I gonna do? Like, what I just what you just you just said that the, doing this is like. Oh, this is fascism, and we can't go down the road of this. And it's like, well, when we do it, it's good. Yeah, like because we're good. <laughs> I, I want to give more context on this so the reader yeah. understands what's happening. And in no way is an excuse. I mean, I think this is fucking reprehensible. So there's this money that was appropriated for this, right? That the admin, the current administration says that it's from the past administration. That's all. I mean, we're three years in, right? I mean, what what <laughs> yeah. the fuck? But. They say that they, Biden says that he couldn't get this money, you know, appropriated to something else. They refused his request, which I'm very skeptical of that. And he says that they have to use the money. But what you have to notice, even if it's true, which honestly, I don't know if, if they can get it appropriated to something else or not, really skeptical on that, like for real, the money doesn't have to be used. And, and what they say is that, if, well, if we don't use this money, then we lose it. Well, lose yeah. it. Like, don't then spend it, it on this. Then use and, it on something else. Yeah. And, and what does that mean, lose it? What, like the money just vanishes into thin air? Like, what the fuck does that mean? Like, so so there's a lot of questions about this. I don't buy the administration's excuse at all. Uh, at the end of the day, the campaign promise, you know, by Biden, he was unequivocal on it. No further construction of the border wall. So, like, lose the money if, it's, if, it's, if that's what we need to yeah. do. You know, and this is going to lead no, – no, it's not just – the humanitarian aspect that it's going to deter people from coming here, you know, possibly cause harm to migrants that are coming here, but it's also create, it creates environmental damage in these communities, destroys ecosystems, wildlife, you know, uh, destroys the, the character of these border communities. And, there's, you know, health, there's health implications, like, like broad public health implications yeah. for a lot of this stuff. Like, and you know, something that I like to say is like, you know, like, I mean, you know, anti-immigrant policies have been a feature of both 
Democrat and Republican administrations. I mean, back when I started my immigration advocacy 10 years ago or whatever, we used to call Obama the deporter in chief. I'm sure you guys remember the tagline. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's kind of a, 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 an inaccurate thing that I'm about to say because both uh, parties have engaged in this. But, you know, we, as you guys noted, we did or people voted for Biden did vote for him with the promise of uh, turning the page from Trump, right? We did not yeah. vote for Biden for a continuation of, of Trump era immigration po- policies. Right. Or and furtherance is, of it, like, or yeah, delivering yeah. on it. Exactly. Fuck, and this, like, that's, that's what's happening, you know? And, and, and I don't want to rent too much, but like with this whole migrant crisis thing, it's bullshit. You know what I mean? Like we were talking yeah. before the show, Colombia absorbed, many more migrants from Venezuela and other countries. And they don't have, you know, obviously there's anti-immigrant hysteria worldwide, but they don't have the level of anti-immigrant hysteria that we see in the United States, right? In the United States, you know, we have outsourced our, our response to this, to these nonprofit groups that are just, they don't have the, 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 the levers of, of, of government to be able to adequately respond to this and have the proper levels of funding that have the proper levels of expertise, to be quite frank, this is something that requires a government response. We could see, you know, uh, uh, abandoned buildings or, or other buildings, facilities, you know, uh, modified or, or, you know, to, 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 to serve as housing for these migrants. And that later could be used for homeless shelters or affordable housing or whatever. We could see work permits authorization. So people that are claiming asylum could work and pay taxes and pay into social security so it doesn't go fucking insolvent you know what i mean and they fill positions in in our you know massive worker shortages that we're seeing across the country you know what i mean like we could see actual resources being funneled from the federal government you know and to 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 help with this with this issue but we could maybe have for the first fucking time ever because it's funny domas you've been here like most of your life but like uh as somebody born here i'm very frequently told like oh well what do you know about what's going on in cuba what do you know about what's going on in you know venezuela and all these other countries and i'm like i don't i know what's going on in my fucking country and i wish that for once my country would have a conversation about the pressure that we exert that creates this exactly on on the global south that creates this these migration patterns look we we've been fucking with the southern hemisphere you know and and other countries in the global south for very long, creating conditions that exacerbate what are called pull factors of migration into this country. And and, and besides that, which what what we just discussed is a very real factor into what's costing migration to our country, we have a massive wealth disparity disparity between, you know, the United States and Canada to some degree and the rest of the continent. And that includes Central America, Mexico, and the Southern American countries and the Caribbean. So of course people are gonna come here because they want a better life for themselves. They wanna escape you know, political instability, violence. They want a better life for their kids and you're not gonna stop them, you know what I mean? So it, it, it's, it's, it's a tough issue. I mean, obviously, you know, most people don't want, some people are adventurous and they wanna migrate and they want new opportunities or whatever, but most people don't. Most, most people, people wanna stay yeah. in right. their home with their families in a place that's familiar. People migrate out of desperation. My family migrated out of desperation because my country imploded after being basically pillaged by uh, the IMF and, and, and other international monetary uh, institutions. And we came here because we were broke and we just, we, we, we needed a, a better economic outlook, outlook for our future. And, you know, we're just, and, and again, this could be something that benefits us all. Like I said, you know, and this is not bullshit talking points, like for real, like we need sources of income to uphold our pensions and social security system. We need tax revenue to build infrastructure and fund, you know, like government programs. We have, you know, sectors of our economy that have massive worker shortages. And that doesn't mean that we, you know, exploit migrants or whatever. We need to unionize them and and give them labor protections and good wages and everything. But we just, like everything else and so many other issues, when it comes to immigration, we're seeing just complete gridlock, complete incompetency, and just a complete lack of political will to tackle this. And And it's not just lack of political will. They use it as a political football you know what I mean? To engage in this like partisan politicking all the time. And it's like, you know, yeah. poor people that get caught in the crossfire here. Yeah. I mean, like the de- demonization, Gerald, is something that happens a lot in these moments where there's like 
a perception or a reality of, a, of like, you know, high influx of migrants coming in. And then we always have kind of the same handful of stories that pop up. And one of them, going back to my point about like, about and, uh, to, to what Thomas said about the push and the pull factors, the one that we never talk about is like, we're quick to demonize, you know, all of these people coming as like, you know, security risks and drug traffickers and oh, we're, they're flooding the streets with fentanyl and stuff. And I, I, it's it, it's always struck me that like we never have this conversation about why the U.S., whatever it is that we've built here, whatever our national project or experiment is here, requires so much fucking narcotics to be poured down our throats. Why we are this yeah. enormous demand center that basically creates and necessitates the fucking cartels. We act as if they're not yeah. providing a fucking service to us. They well, are. Because our our country needs to be fucking medicated constantly, uh, uh, and and I don't know, it feels like that's never a conversation in these moments. We are, are both the consumers, and our law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies have funded, you know, and exacerbated the drug trade globally. Whether it was in Afghanistan and the opium trade, or Plan Colombia and cocaine, so. You know, and, 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 you know, I don't want to be Shit, like... Going back to Vietnam, how much how much heroin did we did, did service members bring in from it, Vietnam? Exactly, Vietnam. and I don't want to be like, the data, man, man, man. But, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, it, it's true. The data, you know, proves that the, the, the fentanyl that is being trafficked into this country is coming through legal, like, through legal entryways. You right. know what I mean? It's not, like, backpacked in uh, on, like, you know, the backs of migrants or something like that. Like, it's ridiculous. ridiculous. Most of these... Most of these and, 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 you know, the, 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 the Republican talking point is that like, oh, these migrants are just surrendering themselves at the border and the Biden administration is just letting them in letting and giving them, them asylum. So you're saying that they're surrendering themselves with backpacks full of fentanyl to CVP? You know what I mean? Like nothing that they say makes sense. And their smooth brained voters don't have yeah. the fucking intelligence to be like, well, but that doesn't fucking add up. Yeah, that doesn't chime. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry, what were you going to say? There, I was just well, I'll, just on the most recent point, like yes, like the full cartoon is these people are coming in, um, bringing um, drugs, uh, getting caught with drugs, and when we catch them with drugs, we give them a free house and a television and a car and an Obama and, phone, you yeah. know, and an Obama phone and all the rest. Like it's just is it like a Biden phone now. It, yeah, I guess it must be. Yeah, the Bidenomics phone uh, runs. You know, r- r- but <laughs> you don't want to get into the price point yeah. on the Bidenomics phones. It's more costly than the Obama yeah. ones. Um, but I want to make the point like a good rule of thumb I'm sorry people, i'm just thinking of like, the biden phone being one of the old folk phones with like the really big buttons on it <laughs> sorry. i would love a biden fo- i would love a biden phone but when you dial a number it patches you through to a different number like kind of like chat roulette <laughs> Dude, chat roulette, man. Wow. or the or no, the biden phone but they, they like it's just the fucking what was the thing that you that the old folks would wear around their neck the like i'm falling in the gig life, up. A oh, life, life alert, alert. yes a life alert like alert. <laughs> sorry, Jerry. What were you going to say? I'm sorry. I was going to say uh, just because you know we were talking about like what the U.S. is doing, um, it, you know, in our own hemisphere. A good rule of thumb for people: if you hear like organs of the American ruling class bellowing about what the Chinese ruling class is doing to us, whether it's fentanyl, whether it's surveillance and data mining, what have you, you can bet money, blind money on. They are just trying to wash their hands clean of what they know the American ruling class does to yeah. its own people and to, to the people within its own hemisphere on a daily basis. Like, ch- like, are there things that China does that are bad? Yes. Like, of course, I'm not going to say that that's not the case. But a lot of what people bellyache about with China is uh, the accusations, whether it's spying on people, whether it's um, drug importation or, or the proliferation of drugs. These are all things they know that America does on a day to day basis, but they need a villain to paint themselves as the hero. Yeah. Like that is just a convenient foil to wash their hands clean of what they they know what they do. All these newscasters are ex CIA anyway, <laughs> or have tried to be and didn't get in. Like they yeah, know. there's like, like a Tucker real Carlson. revolving door. <laughs> like, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> Tucker Carlson is a failed like CIA applicant. Yeah. Imagine uh, being a fe- imagine being a Fed. Now imagine being a failed yeah. Fed. Like that's where you're at. <laughs> the, two pi- the two pipelines the is, the uh, is is uh, failed Fed, failed theater kid, and then like oh, those yeah. are the two. Those are the two. <laughs> Look, you guys talk about Tucker Carlson, and before we leave this this issue to talk about the next the next like um, 
sort of stick on that bundle that I wanted. I, I just wanted to like, I, I put appended it at the end of our notes for this episode, but like it's stuck in my cross since I read it yesterday. This, this article from about four or five days ago by Tim Paget, who, who for folks who don't know who that is, that is the, um, I believe he's the executive editor of the, of WLR of our local NPR affiliate down here. And this op-ed of his ran um, in the Miami Herald, which is our still, um, you know, still our, our newspaper of record. And I wanted to tell, read at least, at least a little bit of this to you guys because I feel like it shows the way that it like presaged this news about Biden. And it, sh- it kind of is concerning, not concerning, it's like downright frightening the way that like the liberal, broad liberal discourse of this shit is headed, right? Tim Padgett is, I happen to know, a pretty liberal guy, like a generic sort of Hillary Clinton type guy. He's from that era of norms in in journalism where you're not allowed to let people know that you have opinions about um about politics or that you're registered uh you know to a political party but he is a broadly like most people in media broadly liberal dude yeah, he's pretty opinionated on his pieces now he is now he is. i'm saying like he comes from that era where like you weren't when you were when he was a reporter you know it's like you you have to hit, uh, ascend to a certain level before you let people know that you have opinions otherwise like yeah. you are in violation of the fucking uh, mcclatchy handbook but um no, this this article that he posted or that that, that he uh, that he uh, had pu- published at the Miami Herald, open border zealotry only gets us more closed border bigotry. So, I, Tomas, I'm really interested to hear what you have to say about this. Uh, this is from his perspective. A few weeks ago, I was on the phone with a leading migrant labor advocate here in Florida. The subject got around to the temporary agricultural work visas known as H two A's. They're uh, they're the passes that let Latin American and other migrants come and go on a seasonal basis, make good money here, and more importantly, make better lives back home. I wondered if the activists thought that this program should be expanded and fine-tuned, a means of restoring more orderly method to the madness of America's ad hoc migrant uh, worker scheme. Um, Couldn't a better H-2A, couldn't a better, couldn't, this might be a typo, couldn't a better H-2A, I asked, help ease the border overflow chaos? Could it alleviate the the mess U.S. conservatives point to when they bray for the sort of immigration crackdowns that hurt the same migrant workers you profess to protect? His answer was no. No, we oppose approaches like the H-2As. We should instead, he insisted, let every undocumented worker in and put them on automatic paths to legal residency and citizenship. He didn't explicitly say we believe in in the open border, but then again, that's precisely what he said. Bro, what the fuck, man? And then he goes on to spend the rest of this article saying, this is what liberals believe. Every liberal, every Democrat believes that we should have 100% open borders with no security uh, and that it is reckless and it's what they radiate. It's the impression that they radiate. And I was reading this and I was like, Tim Padgett wrote this? And I'm like, I I guess this is like a, is this like what we're what we're telling ourselves now that we are that like our Democrats saying like, oh, we 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 do, you know, we are too open border because to my like apart from yeah. this unnamed yeah. fucking they're, bu- they're building a wall, David <laughs> doesn't seem that open fucking border to me. And I, and I don't know. I just felt like this was like and again, this was September 28th. We just learned about um, Biden, uh, you know, clearing the way to, to 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 finish the wall today or yesterday. And um, it felt like this sort of presaged the change, you know, in the posture. And it's really worrying because, like, I, I, I this this is like, I think the new prevailing liberal ethos is like, okay, guys, enough of this, like, silly playtime. We really do have to crack down on it. An election year, David. Fucking A, man. But how is this going to help them year. win fucking elections? This is my point of this whole section that we're doing is it's like, we think that just voting for a different part, and I know that for people who are like, you know, longtime listeners to like leftist podcasts, this is old hat, but like, we think that just voting for a different party is going to fix Florida. And I feel like the issues are way deeper, right? Like, I also wanted to talk about what's going on in New York with how how what, what Eric Adams is doing is not really that much different than a lot of the stuff that we do down here. Like, the failure to react to, um, you know, historic flooding is not that much different than the fact that Fort Myers is still a fucking disaster that you can't even drive through a year after a hurricane. I mean, like, I have a lot of thoughts. I mean, I don't want to promote nihilism either, uh, but I don't want to engage in like partisan hackery either. I mean, you know, and I don't want to give stupid cliche solutions either, but you know, look, if if you're going to engage in electoralism, you got to vote in people with, who are are consistent, have integrity, are willing to take political risks. But beyond that, you need a mechanism, an organizing mechanism to hold them accountable because they are wedded to this political patronage system 
that will make them compromise and make political calculations that are impossible and ultimately harmful. You know what I mean? And, you know, I actually know Tim. I like Tim. And, you know, we are in the the, the things like the the liberal class is in an impossible uh, situation where they're trying to create a, 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 a workable system in a system that's unworkable. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. We live in an exploited t- state of economy where many sectors are completely dependent on the exploitation of not just low wage, but migrant workers. You know what I mean? And and, and look, I think the, the worker visa stuff is, is a complicated issue. We could do a whole episode on it. I, I, I'm very, you know, I, I don't know exactly. There's where a lot I of nuance it, to it because there's a lot of nuance to it, but I do think there's a place to grant visas to workers that do want to come here, perform some work, and do want to go back home, right? Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, it goes back to what we already discussed in this podcast, which is there is massive wealth inequality between the United States and the global South and its immediate backyard, you know, quote unquote backyard, right? I hate using that term. Yeah. In, in the Southern Hemisphere of the Americas. So you're always going to have this pull factor of people that are going to want to come here. And honestly, like, I don't know what the solution is, but I side with the immigration advocate that talked to Tim Patrick. Let me, let me read let you. Let some documented yeah. workers in. Let them fucking work and let them pursue a better life. Because honestly, I mean, it is what it is. This country has spent a lot of its history fucking with countries like mine and other countries in South America and Central America. And, you know, like I I don't want to condemn people to a lifestyle of no opportunity, of violence, of economic, uh, you know, uh, disparity just because of the location that they were born. Right. Just like in this country, we say that a zip code shouldn't determine you know, your children's future and de- depending on where they go to school or whatever, like that applies to people in the, the world. Country, right? Let me let me read you two, two more paragraphs. The perception of border fair, uh, the perception of border laissez faire has also helped open the door to all the shamelessly, uh, shamefully xenophobic stunts that we're, we're seeing right now. Flying migrants to Martha's Vineyard as political props, placing concertina wire at the Rio Grande. Um making it a felony to transport undocumented migrants into Florida. The chest thumping about uh, but brain addled calls in the GOP primary debate to invade Mexico. But it's also helpful or it's, it's also helped expose the left as rank hypocrites as Democratic leaders like New York mayor and Massachusetts governors uh, cry for help amid a flood of undocumented migrants into their progressive bailiwicks. A deluge they didn't seem to make much of a fuss about when it was Texas and Arizona border towns sounding the alarm. This is like no, you know what, David? He's not wrong, not wrong in any of yeah. that. He's yeah. not wrong in any of Other that. Other than like but defining the governors of those two states as the left. But okay, sure, I guess. They- yeah, exactly. <laughs> Eric Adams was a former Republican who is a, a conservative and, and, and corrupt, and by the way. And we, should, we, we should do a, a whole episode on yeah. him. But the, it, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, right? Like, of course, it's, of course it's going to use by xenophobic purposes in this racist ass country. Yeah. And, but, but this is a failure of the federal government to properly react to resource cities, to expedite work permits, to create job placing programs in sectors that need them. You know what I mean? To, to take the opportunity to build infrastructure, to house these migrants that can later be used to house other people. You know what I mean? It's just a failure of, 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 of government being able to do anything, yeah. which is, you know, part of the larger, you know, neoliberal agenda of privatization and the destruction of government institutions and, 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 and know-how in this country that was built during the New Deal and during the Great Society era and, you know, after the 70s and especially in the Reagan era was destroyed. Look, in New York City, there were government, well, sorry, yeah, government-run food pantries back, you know, in the 70s and 80s yeah. that resourced people really well you know what i mean that's been shredded and and again during the after after the reagan era everything was shredded and 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 privatized and outsourced to nonprofits. you know i was reading an article uh, just uh, the 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 other day that my friend our our friend friend of the pod jordan saccharin shared with me um about um how you know like like benefit programs right uh that like like food stamps and other things new york was 
really, really good at, at administering those to, to recipients in the city and they help people, you know, like single mothers and others that needed them. And during the Adams administration, they are not able to, 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 to get them to people fast enough and there's a huge backlog. Like we, we are facing a crisis of government competence and it's not just in Congress, right? We, we fix it in Congress and it's true, but you're, you're like half of city of Miami elected officials are on their current, you know, investigation or arrested. You know, like in New York, we can't do basic things for our residents. I mean, and this is happening in red, blue, you know, and it's not to, sh- you know, I'm not trying to do partisanship right here. Or well, yeah, that's, the that's the point is that it's not a partisanship it's, it's thing. A, yeah. it's, it's a bug in the system that's a feature. Right. You know, we can't do things. The anymore. immiseration is necessary. And actually, it's funny because it's something you said is something that's echoed in this article where and it's something that. It's, it's, it's rhetoric that pisses me off every time I read it, where, like, and this must piss you off even more, where it's like, yes, and this, uh, he says, the open border bunch will say that this is especially this is especially the moment we must be compassionate. Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that we should treat those migrants, we shouldn't treat those migrants like animals, as Trump and his ilk have done, especially since undocumented, undocumented labor props up economies like Florida's. I'm sick of this shit, man. I'm sick of, like, the old, like the only permissible reason that, that undocumented people can be in this country and that even the liberal argument is like, oh, well, who else are we going to fuck over? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I hate it. I hate it. I hate the having this whole, like, oh, well, we don't want to, like, denigrate the immigrant experience. And everyone knows what that means. Like, uh, my mom was an immigrant she had quote unquote the immigrant experience and I, I i really do hate basically saying uh first class citizens shouldn't look down on second class citizens like that's basically what they're saying right. and like it comes from a, an unearned place of like noblesse oblige and I, I i truly hate it um i'm reading this article all I'll, correct me if i'm wrong a lot of his complaints are about the immigration system not immigrants themselves. Like that's the my thing. complaint like, with the article he, is his positioning, right. the way he's positioning right. it. Like, he, oh, he's, li- he's obviously trying to thread Democrats a very weird are all neo. open border right. maniacs, and it's like, well, right. he's, I can't think of an elected official who is an open, who even would utter the word. We should have open right. borders. He, he's trying to basically make it. I'm not xenophobic. It's just an administrative headache, and it's like, all right, so we, so are you telling me we can't, we don't have it in our capacity? Because at this point, you just throw in the tally. We don't have it in our capacity to solve administrative problems. Right. Like we already, we talked about it before. That's not why people are touched on, like, like on this issue. Like they're, like they're seeing clips like we saw on the CNN of people um, pouring over like the, like very, like, just like straight out of, like looking like straight out of daily stormer style, like images. Um, we, we talked about it before, um, back in May, there was a story about very little was done to help in New York city. One thing that was done was 200 people were going to be sheltered in Newburgh rather than New York city. So they were going to be put on a bus and brought up to Newburgh to sleep in three separate hotels. Every like, hide your woman folk style talking point was issued from even our like GOP congressman here, Mike Waller, as to how these people are like a societal menace. We don't know who they are and they're scary and we don't know anything about them. They're MS-13 probably. In order to try to get them out, they manufactured a story on the front page of the New York Post saying that 20 homeless veterans um, were displaced from these hotels to make room for 200 uh, migrants. And only days later did we find out that was all completely manufactured. I think someone was paid off to say that to an assembly member so that he had pretext to go to the post is my remembrance. If I'm wrong, correct me. Um, in other words, they had to make basically saying, um, if you're not being daily inconvenienced by migrants, well, just imagine if you were, yeah. okay, that now that yet, yeah, and also it doesn't ask the question, there are homeless veterans and I don't see anything in the anti-immigrant plank as to what's going to be done to house any home, veteran or otherwise, yeah. anyone who's homeless, the population of which has skyrocketed since COVID. And again, to Tomas's like this, like, point, one of those things that we could easily fix. Like, if those right. are the problems. No, we don't have the administrative capacity. Oh. We can't. It's too much pay. We can't. Hang on. I'm, I'm really busy. My, my arm is too tired from writing checks to the F-35 yeah. program. We can't, like, yeah. It, it's like we figured out how to administratively keep that fucking blunder alive for 20 years and $2 trillion. Ba- barely. Barely. Because apparently yeah. we can't even build fucking fighter jets anymore. Like, yeah. they fucking... Did they fucking get, crash they get and get lost, lost over North Carolina? Like a little bit of rain, bro. Like, and, they, and then the government can't even find it. Did they even find that fucking jet? I don't I know. I don't know, man. 
I, I mean, yeah, it was just like a story that everybody dunked on for a day. And then like, did we even find that fucking F-35? I mean, how much is that fucking thing? Like a hundred million dollars? <laughs> We can't even build weapons of war anymore in this country. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> and I don't want to, by the way. I don't want to do that. But like, we can't do shit. I felt like um, I felt like the biggest biggest cliche ever when a a, a woman that I know was a friend of mine was texting with me was, was said, um, "I've been told that men all have a favorite plane," and I was like, "A ten Warthog." And there's, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh shit! I guess I'm the guy." <laughs> What's it, what's an A ten Warthog? Warthog. It's a, a badass, dope fucking plane. A single, uh, single pilot, um, uh, fighter and bomber. It's a really cool plane. I don't know. It's the kind of shit like you gear into when you're a little kid. A, <laughs> yeah. a single, a, a single seat Cessna. How's that? <laughs> How about this? There was an A ten Warthog uh, pilot one time, um, like in 1996, who was running maneuvers with his with his like group or whatever over the four corners, like Colorado, you know, Arizona. New Mexico, Utah, and just broke off and made a statement that basically, like, he was, I guess, like a closet pacifist, and he was like, "This is my little thing that I can do," and he just crashed his plane, and nobody ever reported on it. I mean, it was, it's, you can find information about it. It would, like, it, it, it happened, but um, like, it, he, it was just, like, just this weird, random '90s pre nine eleven fucking piece of flotsam and jetsam that that like nobody talks about um guys guys let, let me tell you something listener mm-hmm. listen to this i'm gonna pull you guys when was the last ever dog fight that like, airplane dog fight that occurred in history when did maverick come out um <laughs> no i'm serious when was it uh wait was it korea yeah it has to have been no it's not mm-hmm. it was in 1969 and who and, and which countries were involved 1969 so if it was 1969, then it would be um, France and uh, and Vietnam. No, it was Honduras and El Salvador oh, shit, in won? Central America. Oh, man. Look it up, Smithsonian <laughs> listener. I'm not fucking bullshitting you. Yeah. Like, why are we building this bullshit? Yeah. It's a jobs program. It's, a job. it's that. It's all it's become is fucking make. Gotta work. do something. Make work. It's all fucking make work. Um, Gerald, you tipped us off to this to this uh, New York Times article that kind of goes along with with what we were talking about, like um, that Eric Adams in New York City is actually taking this this strong posture now, also against against the the influx of of, of migrants and like kind of keeping in, in in line with like the the Newberg story from like a year ago. That I mean, it's I don't know, man. I just I, I worry about this shit because it's like this, there's there's no who if you are just a human being and you like have a little bit of fucking compassion in your soul and you want to fix your busted fucking state, like who do you vote for? Like there isn't really any like I don't I don't know that it like that like voting in a mayor or whatever is gonna help fucking anything. But well, definitely don't vote for Matt Gates. I'll tell you no, that. No, don't do that. Um, for the listener, um, and I don't want to go too long because I know we're reaching top of the hour. Um, um, Mayor Eric Adams wants to basically have a uh, quote unquote temporary suspension of uh, New York City's uh, right to shelter law, which is from the late 70s, which basically codifies in the New York State Constitution that anyone, man, woman, child, whatever, has the right to shelter. Is the only municipality in the country that has such a law. Um, and so uh, anyone who is looking for a place to go, uh, in theory, can find one. Um, Eric Adams has said that his capacity to house people has been thoroughly strained and can no longer do it. And he would like to, uh, quote unquote, because of an emergency, uh, which, you know, with the state emergencies never end, um, uh, do temporarily suspend the right to shelter. Um, the problem is his whole thing is, uh, they are creating too much of a strain on our social services. His solution to that is to cut our social services. So you can guess, you know, this guy had this agenda to go on, like he, like before any of this, he was already go, probably going to pursue this type of a program, but now faced with some, a, a crisis, which would require you to invest even more in social services, or at least not cut, at least not touch it. Um, and said, no, because things are strained, uh, we need, they're already strained by social crises. So now they need to be further strained by my, <laughs> by my budget. That's basically. not, not going to exacerbate the problem at all. No, no. Basically, um, his, is this basically announcing his intention not to solve problems, right. to basically just ride it out, um, you know, 
we'll get through this by not getting through it, basically. And that's what Which essentially adds up to, sorry, eventually people are just going to die. Yeah. Like, that's what this adds yeah, there's up a human to. Uh, increasingly, politicians are more willing to say that. Yeah. That's crazy. We're, that's we're not, that's we're not exactly what I'm you. getting at. That's it. It's we're like, not working on an issue. We don't know how to fix it. And we're, I'm just going to point fingers and, and be a little crybaby bitch about it. Yeah. Yeah. But what? Please send me five dollars, though. I yeah, need it. For keep my me in the fight. Send me, send me yeah. five dollars to keep me in the fight. When there was, when there was a <laughs> at least again going back to norms, when there was at least the norm that they would like blame it on the other party. Like, okay, like I guess that's the way things are. But now it's literally demonizing the people who are at the heart of whatever the issue is. In this case, the the, the migrants. It's like well, too many of these damn people. We've always, we've always done that. Yeah. Whether it was the Chinese or the Jews or black people or yeah. immigrants, whatever, yeah. like it's it, it's always been someone. This is what Tomas was talking about too. Like with more than a hundred, this is from the New York Times article talking about which area just the Irish. Um, with more than uh, one hundred twenty-two thousand asylum seekers having come through our intake system since the spring of twenty twenty-two, and projected costs of over twelve billion dollars for three years, uh, thir- uh, for three years, it is abundantly clear that the status quo cannot continue," said uh, Mayor Adams. And it's like 120, how many people have come across, that's, that many people have probably come across the border in the last three months from Colombia to Venezuela, uh, from Venezuela to Colombia. And no, but the richest city in the fucking history of planet Earth can't handle, um, can't handle that. And the only grace I'll give him is that he's asked the state in Albany for help and has basically been essentially rebuffed. Like, like that's the one thing I'll say is not entirely his fault. He is a, uh, an egomaniacal mayor faced with a very cruel and cold governor. Um, it's a very toxic brew for anyone who's hoping to see a, a, a good resolution to this outcome. Yeah, we're, we're, we're fucking massively cocked as a country. We can't do shit. Yeah. Yeah. So, good stuff. I, yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty fucking bleak. In the context of Florida, I guess I just wanted to, like, put it into stark relief that, I, I, I mean... Because I hear you hear it all the time down here, Tomas. You heard it all the time, I'm sure too. And you're in like in, in the, the work that you did, where it was a lot of, and even some a lot of our friends, a lot of people that we like. It's like, well, you know, t- t- midterms coming up. Uh, you know, got to are they <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the the next next election cycle? It's going to be the most important one of our lifetime again, and it's mm-hmm. just over and over the same thing. And it's like, okay, number one. It's becoming, to Tomas's point earlier, it's becoming like fucking mathematically impossible to consider a, um, you know, a, a statewide election being won by a Democrat here. Number two, you get him in, and what? This is what they're going to fucking do. So I, I, you're right. We shouldn't be nihilistic. I just, I, I guess what I'm saying is like the, um, this, there are solutions, but they, they exist outside of the voting, the voters booth, I suppose. Yeah, I will say though, I I do wish DeSantis was in governor right now. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. where's <laughs> this might be his last term? I have a, I have a strong feeling. <laughs> well, he's term limited, it's... but <laughs> I know I'm saying even if I have a feeling. You think we might not see him in, in public quickly. life anymore? Like the best place what I was trying to get yeah. at. I don't even think the Senate would take him. Well, but if we get Matt Gates afterwards, Jesus fucking Christ! DeSantis could be yeah. um could be speaker. Maybe he doesn't even have to run for a seat yeah that he would love that speaker, he would adore that how speaker ron DeSantis? no he would hate it because he wouldn't have this cucked complacent legislature doing everything he wants to do he'll have this fucking psychos in the u.s house republican conference just fucking gnawing at his toes at every fucking thing he does right. he's, he's not he's not used to actually having to compromise and placate and look uh, Say what you want to say about Congress, but as as U.S. House Speaker, you got to do a whole lot of compromising. So right. I don't think I don't think that that job would fit him well. I think he would be removed fairly. Yeah, quickly. speakership is I about eating I, shit a lot of times. So, yeah, yeah, but that's the thing; he does that beautifully. Like he eats so much shit. We just we just like watching it. him do it. We just it would be funny. That, he was born for that job. <laughs> it would be funny. Um, oh, yeah. but I don't know. Trump, on the other hand, would be. Perfect. Terror, yeah, we would just be like, yeah, I don't care. Like, whatever. Like, whatever you guys yeah. want. Like, let's shut down the government. Like, uh, he would just anything that he would just use it as a as a, a, a press conference launch pad. That's it. My, right? my favorite yeah. thing about Trump's political instincts and demeanor, or like the 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 immediacy where like he is literally letting go of one branch before he grabs the next one and is in free fall for you know moments at a time, like entire like weeks at a time, where his attention span is so short. 
but the thing that's in front of him is like the most important thing. And then it becomes the most important thing to 10 million podcasters and media morons and shit. And like, it becomes the, it's like, fuck, can you technically buy Greenland? I still don't know. Like, I don't know if we can do that. Like, but if there was ever a congressman who was calling for the speaker to be vacated and the speaker was Trump, he would have just stood directly behind them while they were going on their speech or whatever, just haunting them. Like, just not giving them an inch. I realized that DeSantis probably couldn't get elected back into Congress because um, his buddy Kent Sturmer, Sturman isn't around anymore, who uh, helped him get elected the first time around, uh, which is its own episode that we can get mm-hmm. into one of these days about. Uh, there, there was actually some, new, some news about Kent Sturman, like, from, from his last few days before um, he took his own life. That came out in the last few days. Maybe we'll do an episode on that coming up pretty soon. We absolutely should. <laughs> but... All right. Do we have anything to promote, guys? We have a YouTube channel and we have a TikTok channel. I've been trying to get people to to, to, to oh, go yeah. to that, and um, you know, I don't I don't want to whore, whore us out too much. But if you're listening to us here, like go check us out on TikTok too. Um, any any other things to promote, fellas? Or oh, G- Tomas is going to be on Because Miami tomorrow, or when you're oh, listening yeah. to this, it's today. So um, you know, listen to Because Miami again. Our our buddies over there. Yeah, talking about the the more Francis Suarez content. If you haven't had enough yet, Jesus. There might not, there might not ever be enough Francis Suarez content. It's, it's all coming to an end soon, David. I'll tell you that much. <laughs>